Okay, um, I am very happy to introduce Malachi Rempen, uh, the creator of the webcomic Itchy Feet, itchyfeetcomic.com. Uh, Malachi is from the US originally, but now he lives in Berlin and his wife is Italian and also lives in Berlin, so they have a lot of experience with being expats and language learning. So the comic is about travel and language learning and occasionally life as an expat. So it seems logical that this should be interesting to this audience because uh, many, many people here are expats and most have learned one foreign language at least, most of the time at least two. Uh, so. Um, maybe for some background, uh, I'm a fan of this comic and I thought it made sense that other Googlers should be and it turns out they are because a fellow Googler um, sees one of the comics that is posted about Zurich and he writes, oh hey, if you're ever in Zurich you should uh, look me up and come down to the office and uh, I can give you a tour of Google. And then I jumped on the comment thread and I said, oh yeah, yeah, how about you come and give a talk at Google? And um, to both of our surprise and delight, Malachi replies to the thread, he says, yeah, okay. <laughs> so, uh, so here he is, and um, I will let him do the rest of the speaking. Thanks, Jana. I got the. Can everyone hear me all right? Right on. Got my notes. Cool. So, yeah, as Shauna said, I'm Malachi Ray Rempen. I do uh, itchy feet. The Travel and language comic. Um, how many of you here have, have seen or heard of it? Um, besides, are you kidding me? All <laughs> oh, right, good, good point. Well, it's all right. <laughs> I want the hand like count to be high in my head, so I can be like, yeah, cool. Um, so I was actually born in Geneva, not far from here, but I only lived there for like a year or so, and then my family. Um, we moved to New Mexico, where I grew up in Albuquerque, and then I went to film school in LA. That's what I do professionally. I'm a, a freelance filmmaker, and comics were always ever just a hobby for me. Like it was never something that I wanted to do um, professionally or, or anything like that. But you know, I'm not here talking at Google for my movies, so uh, I. But what I did want to talk about. Kind of, and I'm going to go through some of the comics that I've done and some of the stories behind them and some of the um, problems that I've had with certain ones and sort of things that I've learned and most of all what I've, I ended up learning more about storytelling and more about creative endeavors and what it means to be creative um, and art through this comic than I ever did through any of the films or, or through film school or any of that stuff. So I want to share some of that stuff with you guys. Um, so after LA, I moved to France. I, li we li I lived in Lyon, and I went there for a girl, somebody who may or may not be at the back of the room. Um, and my then girlfriend, now wife, Edith, um, she was studying and uh, doing her Erasmus program there. And I thought, well, I'll come along. France, why not? LA sucks. Um, and I wanted to. It was my first time living outside the country, and I wanted to have some way of chronicling what, of what was happening to me and the things that were going on. But, you know, something to send my mom every week that I could sort of um, explain, like, what life was like. Um, but I didn't want to just do a blog or, like, just send a really long email. Um, and I had always doodled as a kid on papers and stuff, so I thought, well, I'll just do a comic. And, oh, yeah, here's the me being interested in movies. <laughs> um, a side note that will be important later. I, I was always into sort of the big fantasy movies. Like, um, you know, I was always into the Star Wars and the, and the Matrix when I was a kid. And then as I got older, like the Coen brothers, the Wes Anderson, like the people who were building worlds, who were making these sort of these fantastical um, things. I was never really into realism. Um, that aside, back to the main story, I started up the Spleen on France, which was the original um, title. And originally, the guy was a spleen. Like, and all the characters were little body organs. There's like a heart and an eyeball and a pancreas and these things. But it just got irritating to draw a pancreas. So <laughs> and anyway, spleen doesn't look anything like that. So I just ended up being um, that kind of thrown out. But you'll see in some of the early comics, that's where, that's where that comes from. Um, and originally, the comics were just about my very personal experiences, like things, like I said, like like you would write to a friend or family member, like this is what happened to me this week. Um, so this is the first comic I did. Can you read the, how's that, is that all right? Yeah, it's all right. Um, so this was the first one, it was just about like 
you know, you bone up on your foreign language, and then like you try it out, and then you just sort of freeze up. And um, I'm sure if a lot of you have, how many of you here are Swiss? <laughs> yeah. So, so you haven't had that problem here in Switzerland, <laughs> at least. Um, but uh, the the all the original um, here's another one, which is kind of about when you know when you when you're a foreigner in a in a new country, you sort of find yourself you you represent for everybody there. You're like you you represent everybody from your country, and like you have to answer for things that your country has done or cultural things that might you know from wherever you're from. Like you suddenly become the representative of, of where you're from, and at the time when I was um, in in Lyon in, in 2011, um, well, I guess it's never really goes away. But America's you know always on in the news in sort of a bad way, especially then. Um, and I always found it was a lot easier to diffuse the conversation and move on to something that I didn't have to answer for when we talked about food, because like there was nothing that French people love more than talking about food, um, or Italians for that matter. And I spent a lot of time with both, so. Um, and then this was the last one I did, which is just sort of about, you know, when you come back from a really long experience and somebody from home asks, like, how was it? And you go, like, great, because there's no real, you can't explain all of what it was like. You can't sort of get across in any way. They're not really interested. You know, they just want to know that it was good. Um, and that was supposed to be it. I was only supposed to be in Lyon for four months, or we were, and I was supposed to go back to the States. Um, that was in 2011. It's now 2015. I'm, haven't left Europe yet, uh, and I ended up. We um, again, my then girlfriend who was studying, she got an opportunity to do her field work in Morocco. So I said, like, yeah, Morocco, I'm coming too. Um, I'm not going back to LA after like I had this great, you know, experience. We ended up living a year in Lyon, and then in the spring of 2012, she went to um, Morocco. We went to Morocco, and. Um, I thought, well, I can bring back this comic. I can like make it a sort of travel and, and uh, exploring the world kind of comic, and not just about my personal self. It can be, you know, I have lots of plans to travel around the world. We can make it something bigger. And so it couldn't be La Spleen on France. So let's make it something a little bit more um, general about travel. That became Itchy Feet. Um, Again, though, at the beginning, it was just sort of it was sort of a chronicle of specific experiences. So, like this was one of the early ones I did. And if you've never had to take a taxi from Al Khosema to Rouadi in uh, Morocco, you probably can't relate too well to what's going on here. Um, I mean, it's it's kind of interesting and kind of funny, but there's no real personal connection to that. Um, this one um, comes from. I had noticed that when it was really difficult to speak French with French people, uh, at least when you're starting out, because the accent's so strong, but also because, you know, when somebody speaks a language as a native speaker, you, you speak it in a slang way. You use lots of like weird figures of speech and um, sort of a street version of the language. And when you're learning it, you're learning a very academic, um, you know, proper sort of classroom version of that language. And it, it, they don't really mix. In any way, you feel like you're just leagues behind um, a, a native speaker, which you are. Whereas in Morocco, because for them they speak fluent French, but they don't speak it as a, a like as a mother tongue. So they speak a, a fluent classroom French, and so they're kind of it's kind of a nice place to meet halfway. And this is when I this was me trying to express that it's a lot easier to speak a language with somebody who's also learning that language um, than it is to someone who's a native speaker. I don't know if you necessarily improve, but. Um, these are the first comics where I was trying to like express something beyond just making a funny joke about something. Um, but it doesn't always work out, you know. So at the beginning of any cultural uh, or artistic endeavor, you're always trying to uh, you're feeling out the audience. You're feeling out what works, what doesn't work, what kind of the sense of humor is, and like, and and my sense of humor is not necessarily itchy feet. Like, believe it or not, itchy feet doesn't make me laugh that often. But my sense of humor is a lot more absurdist and sort of um, wilder. Um, like this one in particular, I went to Turkey, and they have this in the region called Cappadocia, and they have these beautiful—they're um, called, I think, fairy towers or fairy castle. Uh, 
abodes, which are like these ancient, naturally formed stone spires that then were um, uh, carved into and people made their houses and it dates back to the Middle Ages and such. And um, I thought it was kind of funny. They looked kind of like termite nests. And so I just thought, like, wow, well, wouldn't it be funny if there were actually giant termites in there that were enslaved people? Um, and so I made this comic, which is exactly that. And I still think it's hilarious. But it really, nobody else, like, it was, it didn't really go over that well, not the least, you know, with Turkish people who didn't find it funny at all. Um, but I learned a lot from this. Um, I learned a lot about finding sort of what resonates with people, and you learn. You learn more from the, the, the ones that fall flat than you do, I think, from the ones necessarily that, that hit on the mark. Um, here's an exa another example of one where the first time people actually got angry at me. Uh, I, did, I had noticed that in Turkey, you know, in Germany, um, the Turkish people often complain, I think justifiably, that they are treated like second-class citizens in a way um, by the Germans. And I had noticed that in Turkey, they sort of, just in passing, that they kind of did the same with Kurds. Um, and so I made this comic about it, but uh, this is where you know, people got upset at me. This is the first time I actually got hate mail. Um, and I kind of realized that you know, I don't know enough about this. Like, I'm, not, I'm not in a place to speak for either of these two parties. I'm just, I was a tourist for like two weeks, and I walked through, and I think I can have something to say about this um, ongoing and very deeply rooted conflict. Um, and I sort of, so that's, this is the, the one where I was like, you know, I should stay away from politics. I should just stick to stuff stuff that you know. You know, stick to what you know. Um, and so that's what I did. And when I moved to Germany, I made a lot about German culture, which I felt a lot more comfortable making fun of, being half German myself. Um, and like this one in particular, which I'm sure will resonate here in Switzerland just as well, which is, you know, coming from France in in Lyon. You, the red light is just a suggestion. The red light is just like you only. It's only so that you know to look for cars when you're crossing. Like it's not a. It's but it, whereas when I came to Germany, it was like the red light is law. The red light is is to protect you. You are you are you you are beholden to the light, and uh, and you know th this one was great because I think the Germans recognize this about themselves and they can recognize this uh, this sort of funny quality about the more ridiculous of, of in their number. Um, and I think that's another important thing. Oh, well, I have another one that's sort of along these lines, um, which is actually in Switzerland, which is that I came last summer and noticed that the Swiss would prefer not to speak high German if possible. Like, they'd rather speak English and, and then speak, despite the fact they're very proud and justifiably, again, very proud of the fact that they can speak perfect high German. It's just sort of bad on the tongue, doesn't they? You know, it's like, Ugh. And so they prefer to speak English. Um, and I think what, what I learned about doing these two comics in particular is if you're going to, if I'm going to make, make fun of some aspect of a culture, then it's better to sort of take it and exaggerate it um, rather than just sort of commenting blank, like blankly on what it is. Take it and make it ridiculous, and then you can kind of see the truth behind it. Um, Right, then I got, after this um, this one and others, I got more into also doing more comics about language learning. And this was the first one that, I've, that I really got a really positive feedback on. Um, and it's just about uh, the fact that, you know, again, Germans, English is so much better than your German that it's just so much easier just to speak English, especially in Berlin. Like it may not be the case in some other countryside in Germany, but in in Berlin, where I'm living right now, like there's, it, you'd be hard pressed to find a, a, a German who didn't also speak perfect English, um, especially in, in in my generation. Um, and this was the first time that I was sort of trying to make comics that were communicating an idea, and they weren't just um, making like a weird joke. That it was actually I was trying to, um, I was, you know, you're feeling out the point at which you and your audience meet and where you can communicate to them through a message. Um, and these were the first ones that, where I was trying to do that and I was succeeding, right? Failed in the ones that you'd seen before. Um, and this is the first time, the first time that people said to me, people were commenting and saying, like, this is so true. That's so true. 
And that was something I'd heard a lot when I was going through film school. Like I said, I was really into you know building worlds and making these sort of fantastical things and spaceships and aliens and back in time and stuff like that. Um, but and people, what people kept saying to me and what I kept hearing over and over is you know two things. One is write what you know. You hear that a lot. Like, um, and then the second is tell the truth. And I didn't really know what either of those things meant. Like, how do you tell the truth if you're making a, a space fantasy? How do, you, how do you write what you know if you're writing uh, about dinosaurs on Mars or whatever it is? Um, and this was the first, like, through HE Feet was the first time that I started to understand what tell the truth meant, which is speak from your experience, speak from your perspective on the world and things that you personally have gone through because if you have, then there's chances are that other people have to, and that's where you connect people. And that's how large space fantasies are so relatable to us. It's not the space fantasy part, it's the human story at the center of it that we connect to as human beings. Um, so thank you, Itchy Feet. <laughs> uh, this one, yeah, again, it's, this was just sort of a general about how I had. I've noticed that it, it, the more you learn of a language, the more you realize you have left to learn. It just gets harder and harder as the higher you climb up this, this hill. Um, and you realize the, that your goal is actually getting farther and farther away, depending on what your goal is. Um, and around this time, I started to see that I, the, the, the comics had become fairly popular within the language learning community. And this was sort of, this became the, it still is today, like my sort of bread and butter of the, of the comic is the people who were learning new languages. Because there wasn't really a, a voice for people who were going through that experience, at least not in the comic form. Um, and so this is, the, this is when I started to realize that I was not just doing comics for myself, that, you're, that I was serving a community of people, that it, it was something I was doing for others. And this is, Another really important lesson when it comes to creative endeavors, there's, there's, there is a certain element of it that has to come from you, right? You have to be honest, you have to be truthful, you have to write from what you know. But it's not for you. Like the end product of truly resonating art or truly good um, creative work, not saying that this necessarily is art, just saying that, that, that the goal of art is to to reach other people. It's for other people. You're doing it to teach other people or to, or to um, reach out to other people. It's about um, you're serving, not receiving, if that makes any sense. Uh, and one where this uh, didn't go so well. Um, oh yeah, well this one. Uh, this is one that was, uh, I, I think, was one of my biggest failures. Again, it's a Swiss comic, and it's uh, the idea came from traveling through Switzerland, and seeing that in, in they just have so many lawn gnomes, like in their in especially in the countryside, like they just they're everywhere, just sometimes overflowing. Like I don't think think this drawing is necessarily an exaggeration on the first, um, and so the joke was kind of like, oh well, it's kind of like a. a um, uh, like a drug addiction, like I think you've had too much, like an, an intervention. Um, but because, like, it, uh, this is the first time I had people going, like, I love the comic, but I don't get this one. Or, like, people, you know, and, and it was the first time that usually I, I send the comics and they go through my wife first. And she laughs at them, and if she laughs, that means it goes out. And if she says, I don't get it, um, that means it, nobody's going to get it. And this was the first time that she said, mm, I don't get it. And I was like, eh, I don't think you're right about that. Like, maybe just... Maybe it's a language uh, issue thing, or maybe she doesn't know about drug interventions or whatever. <laughs> like, <laughs> whatever it is, I'm wrong and she's right. And I was completely wrong. And uh, nobody got it. And so I think the important lesson I learned from this one certainly is um, always listen to my wife. But, it's a, but as far as creative work goes, to get outside perspectives, sometimes you can be very um, tunnel visioned and, and think that your perspective is the one that um, it's the only one that matters. And in reality, like I said, you're doing this for other people, so it's good to have a second voice to be like, ah, this doesn't reach me, especially an honest one. Um, or this one does. Like, and if she laughs out loud and says, this is going to be a good one, then it usually, then it usually is. Um, as far as perspectives go, it can be hard sometimes. It can be tricky. I wouldn't say hard, but it's tricky to represent uh, um, features of other cultures because of this fact that we 
we all each come from a particular perspective, and we all come from our own cultural perspective. So this one was a, a perfectly respectably uh, popular strip, uh, as far as my standards go, that um, is about how, again, Germans speak such good English, you have to go all the way out to the countryside to, um, to find someone who you could practice German with, and even then they speak uh, English. And what I had done with this one is, you see in the sixth panel here, in this one here, I wanted a um, I wanted the name of the sign to be something that was the equivalent in English of Nowhereville or like, uh, you know, Podunk Town or whatever. Just to sort of this, you know, imaginary place where it's in the middle of nowhere. So I asked a friend in Berlin of mine and he said, oh yeah, we call that, we say Buxtehude. And so I said, fine, you know, Buxtehude, perfect. I've done my research. Um, put it up there. And all of these people from Buxtehude <laughs> Started writing comments going like, it's not in, it, you've clearly never been to Buxtehude because this is, it's not in the Alps. We're not in, uh, near, anywhere near Munich. It's on the sea and we're very respectable. It's a nice big city. And I was like, I'm so sorry. I didn't know, I didn't mean any offense. So what would you say for, uh, for the middle of nowhere? And um, they said, Hintertupfingen, which um, is sort of, a, yeah, it just means, it's just a, it's sort of a word that just means back of the woods, nowhere kind of a thing. Um, but that was, that was, the lesson from this one was definitely like, you know, if you don't personally know for a fact that this is the way that it is, universally, especially when it comes to cultural matters, like do your research, check it twice. And now I go through like every, sometimes I have comics, uh, especially more recently, that go, that feature a lot of languages that I don't speak or even read. And so I always, like minimum like two or three people, I try and put it past them just to, so that they can sort of check off and go like, yes, this makes sense. or you know you didn't use a you know a dirty word here or whatever um, because I don't know how was I supposed to know books to hooting you know <laughs> never heard of that before um, and again this one this is an earlier one um, and it comes from again about personal experience my this didn't come from me this came from my mom who went to India and said like oh we had these great lassies and did you know they use these old washing machines to make the lassies with and I thought it would be hilarious if like oh wouldn't it be great if they left their laundry in the lassie washing machine well again nobody like if people were from India were commenting like I've never heard of this in my entire life like I'm from India and and it was just that you know first of all again it's not really a cultural thing it's a it's just making a dumb joke and then also um, it's not my perspective. It's something. So I stopped doing secondhand stories. Like I stopped doing stories that came from other people because I don't know what their experience was. Maybe that was just the in this one village they make them out of the old uh, washing machines. Or maybe it was just this one weird old lady who did it. And like you know, unless you had been also to this lady's house and had her lassies, you would have no way of knowing if they were made out of washing machines. Um, so it's always best to you know rely on um, to make sure that you're that you're grounding in your own personal experience. Uh, and this is where it definitely works. Like this is one I think that um, <laughs> that that I sort of fired on all cylinders with, which is just it's about how in in Catalonia they um, they don't have Santa Claus. They have this flying log that um, uh, you hit. The kids have to hit with sticks, and then it it craps out their presents. And this was the first time I never did a I didn't use a punchline because it was like I couldn't think of anything that was possibly more ridiculous. Than this, than this idea that it was just like just let it exist on its own. Um, and again, with this one, I was like, this I have to do my research on. Like this can't. Maybe it's just one family, like one bizarre region that they do this. No, it's not like I checked with Catalonians, and they're all like, we love this crazy tradition that we do, and um, they have more Christmas traditions that have to do with crapping. Like that's, that's some sort of thing that that they do there. Um, but again, like, check, to, check my sources, check multiple people, went out on Twitter going, like, everyone from Catalonia, is this true? And they were all like, yeah, absolutely. So, done. Great. And we can laugh. We can all laugh about it. Um, so, but I didn't want to just do, you know, language learning, it's great, again, that that's the biggest community, but I wanted to also expand and make more about the travel experience and um, just general, um, yeah, travel, foreign cultures, going around the world and sort of seeing the world from foreign eyes. And so, like, for example, this one is about how the more you travel, the less you have to pack. And again, taking it, exaggerating it. Um, 
but making it less specific to my personal experience and trying to make it more generally relatable um, to general audiences. And I guess it's a part of feeling out the what the audience is interested, what they're reacting to, how you're um, uh, resonating or not with, with the different people. Um, this one was because, you know, when I was a teenager backing, backpacking through Europe, for example, I always had the big dirty backpack. You know, I was one of those guys that had the, you know, with all the kinds of, all kinds of different compartments and stuff and tons of everything I could possibly need, this huge kind of heavy thing. And very proud of it, you know, and always kind of sneering at the jet setters with their fancy bags and stuff. And then uh, last year I went on a business trip, like a proper business trip, where I had to have a suit and I had to have like a rolly bag. And I was like, oh my god, like I don't have to carry everything on my back. They have, it has wheels, and I can pull it around. And it's like I can't believe, like I couldn't believe it. So, again, just comes from those sorts of observations. Um, this one, for example, uh, has to do with. Going to, I went to India when I was in high school, and I noticed that it wasn't until I came back that the real culture shock hit. Because you expect it to be weird, and you expect it to be different, and you expect there to be all kinds of different. Um, you expect to be uncomfortable when you're when you're going to some place that's so different from your own personal culture, wherever that is. And it's not until you come back to your own country that you sort of realize, like, like whoa, this is suddenly very different, and that because that's not what you're expecting. Um, like, for example, in the States, I always come back. Every time I go back to the States, it's just amazing to me how big everything is and how it's just, it's, I still can't comprehend. I mean, this isn't even really an exaggeration. Like, these, you know, just people are huge. Like, portions are huge. Supermarkets are just, I can't, you know, a, a big supermarket here in Europe could fit in one of the aisles of these, of these places. Um, right, so... I think what I learned from strips like this in particular is that internal observations are oftentimes more interesting and definitely more relatable than external observations. Like it's great to, that we can laugh about the Christmas crapping log, but I think the, the ones that, that we can all connect on are, are things where you look back on your own, you, you um, dig into your own personal internal experience. Um, and so for any creative endeavor, like that's what you have to do. I think it was... Um, Hemingway, who said that when he when he writes, he just sits down at his typewriter and then bleeds, because he's just digging up all of this, um, you know, this emotional derritus that comes out of, and then just like blah, bleeding it onto the page. This isn't, this isn't the work of Hemingway, but it's uh, the idea is that um, internal, like looking back inside, is more interesting than you observing upon the outside world. Um, so what makes a good comic, I've also learned, is that ironically, like people all the time come up to me and say, like, oh, this, here's something funny that happened to me. Um, this would make a great comic. And I actually found that people's personal travel experiences, including my own, as I said earlier, like they're not, they're not that successfully translatable to, to, a, to a general comic because, and because the, they're so specific that it could only have happened to that one particular person on that particular day on that particular trip. If you were to go on the same trip as somebody else and the exact, walk the exact same path that they walked, you would come back with totally different stories. Um, that's why travel stories are fun to hear, is because they're so particular to that person's experience. Um, and for that reason, I don't usually, I, I stay away from making comics that are about personal, like, specific travel stories. And man, if I could figure out a way to do it, like if I could figure out a way to make comics about these kinds of stories without making fun of the person telling the story, uh, I think it, you know, I would have a much longer list of to-do comics. So I'll just go briefly a little bit into how I make the comics. My sketchbook, and I have the pen and paper and an eraser. Um, I first, when I come up with an idea, I don't start with the joke um, because that turns, turns into comics that end up to be much more, much, more, much, more, um, much more shallow. I start with the idea. So I start with the observation of like the thing that um, I've noticed, um, the truth. You know, I start with the true statement, which I think is a, is a good starting point in any kind of creative endeavor. Um, 
So for instance, this week, I want to do one about Switzerland, because we're here in Switzerland. And there's been one at the top of my list. I've got this list on my phone of, of all the itchy feet ideas that I've been wanting to do a comic about, but I can't think of the, how to do it. Sometimes they'll sit there and they'll germinate on this list for a year. In this case, it was a year. I wanted to do one about how the Swiss trains are always on time, but like to a ridiculous degree. You know, they're, they're super on time, and they leave right on time, exactly when they're supposed to leave. Um, which, again, is sort of a sort of banal observation, but it would make a good comic if I could take that and exaggerate it. Um, so I start with that idea, and then I think of the, what the joke's going to be, and then I sketch it out. This on the left side of the page is a, sort of the, the rough sketch. Um, so like, here's the sketch I came up with the comic. Um, you don't have to worry about it's kind of with the arrows and stuff figuring out. But the point is to get it all down there on the actual, um, on this sketch version before I go to the actual drawing of it. Um, and the reason is that you always want to begin a project with the end in mind. Um, and this is something I've, that I've definitely learned through Itchy Feet. It's taught me a lot about the filmmaking that I do and the screenwriting, for example, that I do. When you, when you want to start a creative project, you have a creative idea, you want to get right to the fun part. You want to get right to the part where, um, like it, for filmmaking for me, is like being on set and working with the actors and placing the camera and, and, and working with the special effects people and figuring out like the costumes and stuff. Like That's the fun part. But you can't get to that part until you have the script. And not just have it, but that it's done and that it's a complete story. You can't just be, I mean, some directors totally do improvise on set, but I'm not that kind of creative. I need to have it all worked out beforehand so that you don't um, you know, get messy when you're uh, in the actual part that's fun. Then, you're, then you're, you have this backbone that you can rely on to be good at the end of the process. And so that's, that needs to be there in this script. The sketch, this like rough sketch, has to be there before um, I start drawing. The fun part is the drawing, but it has to wait. Um, then I do the pencil sketch, and I ink it. Um, and I, I ink all the pieces separately on the page, and then I scan that, I take a photo of it, and put it into Photoshop and kind of align all the materials. I try to, as much as possible, stay away from the computer because, you know, all of our lives are on the computer these days. Like, our work is on the computer. Our, our movies are on the computer. The things that we do for fun are on the computer. Our games, chatting with friends, Skyping, like, all of it is on the computer. And so I wanted to keep as much of this process where I could just take, like, half an hour and put the computer aside and do something with my hands and something physical. Um, Again, I do it in Photoshop at the end because, you know, it's better and easier. <laughs> but I don't want to use the tablets. Like, I, I refuse to use those, uh, those drawing tablets for now. And then this is the, the final version. Um, right, so this will come out on, on, uh, on Sunday, which, again, haha, they're so on time, right? These Swiss trains that even a delay is only seven seconds. Um, so the style of Itchy Feet comes mostly from, as I said, I wasn't really ever a comics person. I did read the newspaper comics, um, so a lot of it's influenced by comics like Calvin Hobbes and The Far Side and uh, um, the other ones. I would read them every single morning. And the funny thing is, in the States anyway, um, they have what's called the funny pages. And the funny pages is just a page in the newspaper that's top to bottom newspaper comics. And none of them are funny for the most part, <laughs> but they're called the funny pages. And I remember my brothers asking me, because I would read them every single, religiously every single morning, why do you read this? They're not, you're not laughing. You're not even smiling. And I think it was to, because I like the drawings. Like I liked the, to, I learned a lot about the cartoony style of the drawings through the, through the newspapers. And it was only recently that I looked at the Itchy Feet guy, and I kind of saw where the, where the two of them met, uh, or where it came from. So it's sort of this, if you take Homer Simpson, if you've ever seen Don Hertzfeld, his fantastic uh, rejected cartoons, these sort of bizarre, abstract, uh, hilarious cartoons, you smash them together and you get the, the itchy feet guy. So the lesson from that is stealing is good. Um, what was it the, in, a, in a creative sense? Um, the, was <clears throat> Steve Jobs that, was, that said that... Um, if anyone ever seen these videos, Everything is a Remix? It's this guy that basically makes these video essays about exactly this fact, that everything creative in our culture is remixed from something else. Like, there's no such thing as an original anything. And 
in that video, he has this example of this, this interview with Steve Jobs, this video interview where he says, we steal shamelessly from other great ideas. We steal great ideas all the time because they're great ideas and they belong to us, to everyone. And then directly after that, it was like um, when Android came out and he was saying something about, uh, I will go thermonuclear war on this. They've stolen our ideas. Like, they've taken our best subjects. <laughs> And uh, people get protective, you know, but, the, but creatively, I, I do agree that it's not just that it's okay to steal and that there is no real original ideas. It's that you have no choice. You don't, you don't create in a vacuum. You create from your inspirations and you create from the things that subconsciously bury into your brain like little parasites and then come out and, into uh, bean-shaped uh, stick figure characters and bulgy eyes. Um, so... That's itchy feet now. Um, what itchy feet could be for me. I mean, again, it's as long as I keep um, telling the truth, I feel like I'll have something that everyone will be able to relate to in some way. You know, now that I've married this famous Italian girl, uh, we've started sort of an international family, and so you know, it'll be eventually. I'm, I'm working more strips into how, what it's like to be married to somebody that's from a different culture and, and be part of a family that's a completely foreign culture to yours. Um, and then I assume, you know, at some point down the line, there'll be lots of little itchy feet people, and it'll be about, uh, you know, and the comic might change to being about what it's like to travel with a family. And, and man, like, who can't relate to screaming kids on the plane or, um, you know, the problems of uh, the way different cultures treat kids and as they travel around. Um, and then I assume at some point, you know, it'll be about traveling as an old person when robots carry our luggage. Um, and, and I suppose they'll probably put itchy feet on my tombstone. <laughs> uh, despite the fact that, again, this is a hobby. Like, this isn't what I do professionally. It's just something I do for fun. But, you know, when, when you do something and it, and it resonates with even one or two other people, it just, you got to keep going. You know, you're, you're serving someone. Suddenly you're serving them. Um, you're doing it for someone else. And so I guess that would be the, if I had any one particular takeaway, that, um, it would be that find something that's creative. And I have to tell you guys this, you work at Google. But um, that to do outside of your, your work life and, and tell the truth with it, whatever it is, tell the truth. And if you don't know what that means, that's OK. I didn't either, and I'm not sure I still do. But keep doing it until you find out what that is, like what it means to tell the truth in, in any of this creative work. Um, as for myself, I have another project I just started, which is a, um, a series of kids' fantasy adventure books, and it's where I've managed to mix my love of, like I was talking about, you know, fantastic adventure with the truth of what it's like to have that that joy of getting on a, a boat or a plane and traveling to some new place and, and, and having some new adventure, and so that's the feeling I'm trying to that I'm that I want to instill into 12-year-olds, or at least bring up from my in, in, internal 12-year-old. Um, that's it. So yeah, I'm on Patreon if you want to support the hilarious, hilarious comic arts. Um, and I believe that's all I have to say. Thank you so much. <laughs> if I'm doing, yeah, so if, this, if you have any questions, we'll do a little Q&A. Yeah. Sir, curiosity. So, how often does it happen that you finish one cartoon and then you have to say, okay, I totally have to reject this, or something? So, every every cartoon you publish, there are like three others that you reject. Or oh, I see. Like, as far as like ones that get past my wife, or <laughs> <laughs> it depends. I sorry. Uh, the question was, what do I? What, how often do I reject strips, right? Or what's the what's the success to failure rate of the? Most of them go through. Like I would say, 90% of them go through because I try and figure it out. Um, first of all, I've gotten better recently at figuring out what's going to work and what's not going to work. Um, at the beginning, though, it's early on. I did a lot of going back and like drawing a new frame and going back and adding it and maybe changing the joke and trying to figure out a way because you know she might say like, mm, like I get what you're trying to say, but it's not funny or whatever, and then I would. OK, try and refigure the joke. But I'd say it doesn't happen very often, because I, um, I've gotten more disciplined about finishing it at the sketch level, like that it, that the, where the core of it's done. 
and then the rest is just basically frosting on the cake, you know what I mean? Sorry, one more. So how many do you make? So what's your circuit? So you make like one per month? Oh, I do them weekly, every week. One, two? Yeah, every, every Sunday. Uh, and recently it's been a lot of uh, very, very last minute like a Saturday night, like I'm going, but I've done it for three years now, every single every single week. Even when I go on a trip, like I'll I'll write them in advance. Like right now, I've got some travels coming up, so I've written like the next four or five in, in advance, and I've scheduled them to go. But that rarely happens. Usually, it's like me scrambling at the last minute to come think of something funny. <laughs> yes, Jeff. How long does it take me once I have the idea to actually sit down and draw it? Um, oh man, that depends on how close I am to the deadline. Uh, <clears throat> sometimes I'll sit like I'll, I found I found, and it's not just with HP, it's with um, writing as well. That a big part of the creative process is staring blankly into space, or staring at a wall and accomplishing nothing, or you think you're not accomplishing anything. In, in reality, what you're doing is is you're you're working on it, you're stewing it, you're cooking it. Um, but it feels like a lot of wasted time that you're sitting, staring at a wall. And what, and, I, and I used to hate that part of it until I read about Pixar, that they actually, um, they know that this is what, how the creative process works, and they schedule that time into their development of their stories so that um, when they hit the wall, even if it's a big group, group of genius storytellers, they hit the wall, they can't figure out what to do next, and they go like, all right, well, let's go you know, do something else for a couple days. And it's planned. They plan this, 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 this block, this section where you're just sitting there like, like banging your head against an idea and you can't think of something. So to answer your question, um, usually like a couple hours. Usually I, I sit there and I'll like have blocked this time aside to do it, so I'll sit there and I'll say, okay, this is the idea. That doesn't work. That doesn't work. Oh, this would work. Nah, that doesn't work. Uh, and then a couple hours later, like once it clicks, and I, like I said, I get the sketch down, then it's just an hour or so of like drawing it, scanning it, getting it up there. I mean, you can see these aren't the most complicated drawings. I, I deliberately wanted to simplify it to make it something that I could reasonably do in my free time. Any other questions? Yeah. Yeah, my day job is a uh, like freelance um, filmmaker. So I do like commercials, I do internet films, I do image films, I do um, promotional films, I do short documentaries, I do sort of whatever comes down the pipeline. Um, but because I do that, I'm self-employed and it's freelance. It's not really it's all a day job. Um, hey, it would be great. Like if I could figure out a way to to make itchy feet be to pay my rent, then I could you know not have to worry about trying to put food on the table and actually worry more about doing doing quality comics, which would be great. Um, I haven't figured it out yet, although to be honest, I haven't uh, I haven't tried too hard to make it my day job. I don't know, I feel like I almost don't want it to be. Because if it, if it became the thing I got paid to do and the thing that was that I was making a living from, I'm worried it would become work. And if it became work and it would somehow put a different kind of pressure on it and I'm worried that that would actually affect the the quality of the comic, um, but I don't know. I've never done anything creative in that way professionally before, so others have done. I'm sure it'll be fine. <laughs> yeah. Readers? Uh, yeah, sort of. Mm. I've gotten to the point. I first had. I've crossed a milestone I had for myself, which was I wanted to meet somebody and give them my Itchy Feet business card, um, and then they would say, oh, I've heard of you, or like, I've seen your work. And that happened recently, and I was so, so excited, um, because it's like, it's like, a, it's like uh, I don't know, it's just another, it, it makes the world a smaller place, you know, which is really cool. So I don't actually know the exact number. I, d I know I get a couple, it varies depending on um, whether the comic's any good and whether people respond to it or not, but um, like, as far as traffic goes, I get between ten and twenty thousand um, unique visitors a month, which for a lot of webcomics is nothing. That's pennies, and for a lot of webcomics, that's a ton. Uh, that's like incredible. Like that's uh, you know world fame. So I don't know. I have no personal metric against which to sort of say whether I have a lot or a little viewers. Fact is, I'm here. I'm talking to you guys. That's enough for me. That's pretty cool. 
Uh, yeah. Do I do anything to um, to publicize it on social networks? I'm just repeating it for the, for the video. Uh, do I do any um, prom self promotion on social media and stuff? Yeah, I do. I pretty much just Reddit uh, is the only one that I that I use. The language learning community there is really great, and they um, they they support the comics. I do it in a big way. Um, and then on Facebook, it kind of has a mind of its own. The the promotion thing. So. I publish it on Twitter. That goes automatically to Facebook. It's all designed for me to do as little work as possible. <laughs> but, like, it's all automated, and then it goes out, and then I um, and then I respond to people obviously when they when they talk to me. But I don't know. I have a lot to learn in this field for sure, and I think uh, I, every day I'm learning a little bit more about it. I think I need to up the game a little bit for sure. Yeah. So I found people who took uh, like within my work area. I could get about six of the nine tongue twisters. Okay. I was wondering if you could go through the ones in Esperanto and Korean. Oh, hey, now you put me on the spot. Uh, I don't have it here. Oh, here. I've got it done. Yet. <laughs> <laughs> Does this have internet? Can we just kind of just bring that up? Like, if I could bring up the site, then I would just I could just go to it. And then is there like the Nice. <laughs> Tiny twisters from around the world. <clears throat> so, what do you mean you got? Like, what do you mean got? Uh, I can find people who could read them. Uh huh. Okay. Sort of talk about what they were about. What the like the drawing behind it was? Yeah. Yeah. The, so the, the, the words. Were. So the French one is uh, are the. Um, the socks of the Archduchess uh, dry or very dry, or is it not dry? Archie sesh? Um, very dry. So is it, are they dry or very dry? Um, the second one's Italian. I can actually say this one. Sopra la panca da capra crepa. Is that good? <laughs> <laughs> On top of the bench, the goat lives. Under the bench, the goat dies. Um, the next one's in Russian. I can't. Can anyone do it here? Russian? Okay, go. <laughs> so Carl steals Carla's coral, and Carla steals Carl's clarinet, which I think in English is a perfectly, perfectly good tongue twister. The next one's Portuguese. Anyone can do Portuguese here? Go ahead. <laughs> In Brazilian Portuguese, okay. Um, okay, and it could be that it's like a Portugal Portuguese one. Um, and that just means, when I understand, the a rat gnaws on the cork of the rum of the king of Russia, right? Um, Japanese one, anyone? Japanese? <laughs> and that means in the garden of Mr. Niwa, which I couldn't fit into the drawing, two chickens suddenly eat a crocodile. That was really hard to figure out how to draw that. I'll say that. Like I knew I had to, I knew I had to draw that, but like two chickens eating a crocodile. Like how do two chickens eat one crocodile? Um, the next one's Hebrew. Anyone? Anyone do Hebrew? Oh no. I can't either. Uh, and it sounds really funny, too. It's like, what 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 But uh, it means, um, did you, you were supposed to clean the locker. Did you clean the locker? I'm not going to clean the locker. You clean the locker. <laughs> that's, what the, that's what that one is. Uh, Korean? Anyone? Hangul? No? Better than mine, I'm sure. <laughs> you can even see it like, well done. Not bad, right? For a, someone learning, fantastic. So it's you can even see. Like, I love this like little circles, like gong 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 gong. 
Um, it's, it's, it even looks like a little tongue twister for your eyes. Um, and that means uh, uh, Kang is the president of the soy sauce factory, and Kong is the president of the bean paste factory. I mean, they're all nonsense, right? Uh, the next one's Turkish. Can anyone be Turkish? Turkish? I'll do it. I don't speak Turkish. Kartal, kal, kartal, sar, kartal, kar, kar, kartal, kal, kar. And it means the branch bends and the eagle takes off. The eagle takes off and the branch bends. Uh, the last one, Esperanto. Come on, someone, Esperanto. Nobody here can do Esperanto? This one, I don't know how to say it. I guess, serpo, servo, pun, simper, serpo, el, servo, servo, servo. It's my guess. And it means... Uh, uh, what's this? What's this knife called? Does anyone know this particular kind of knife? It's like, e, not. It's like that's the sword, but there's like a knife, like a kind of a kind of machete. It's typical. It's like a bow knife. Not not a bow knife. Bull knife. Something like that. So anyway, it's. Uh, I hope this large knife will help you to scoop out the brains of that Serbian deer. <laughs> Thanks, Esperanto. <laughs> so, uh, any other questions? Yeah. Can you tell us where we can buy Liechtenstein Army knife? A Liechtenstein Army knife? <laughs> oh, did, did you go to Liechtenstein? Yeah. <laughs> they didn't even call them the Liechtensteinian Army knives. <laughs> For anyone who didn't uh, get the Liechtenstein joke. Uh, I had, I guess I'm not gonna scroll through the whole thing, but it was. Um, I went to Liechtenstein, and it was basically exactly like Switzerland, except even smaller. And they didn't even like they had like the same as chocolates and the same cheeses and the same everything, except they put Liechtenstein on. But it's true, they didn't actually do that on the on the army knives. <laughs> you got me. Are you happy? <laughs> Oh, I'll show you. Uh, how do I get the URL bar again? Okay. So uh, it's going to be a series of books that I'm going to um, do for, for print, but for the moment, it's um, there's, there are short stories that are set in that same world um, that are uh, they're for free online. You can get them right now. I'm working on other versions. Right now it's PDF, but um, uh, I'm working on getting them for iPad and Kindle and so forth. And there's going to be six short stories with each of the main characters. It's about this family, basically, of, of uh, adventurers. And each of these short stories is going to be set from one of their points of view. And then there's going to be a series of books that come out after that. Um, but they're all, uh, you know, charmingly illustrated. Um, uh, and it's like my, my childlike love of old, those books where you open up and it's, like, it's full of stuff. It's full of like diagrams and they've got cutaways of things and they've got, uh, you know, uh, machines and they've got how things work and I've got recipes and like all kinds of stuff. So um, like in addition to being a fully illustrated book series. So right now they're free online on the site. Any other questions? Uh, thank you guys so much. You were so, so great. Thank you.